Hello everybody, I'm Laura Partridge and I'm Associate Director of Education here at the RSA and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's online event, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist Educator. I'm delighted to have the chance to talk this afternoon to four fantastic guests. Let me briefly introduce them to you. Uh, so Zara Bay and Ro uh, Henry Grant are co-founders of the Coalition for Anti-Racist Educators, a new grassroots network committed to the eradication of racism within the UK education system. Uh, Rose a languages teacher at Wellsway Secondary School uh, in Somerset and Zara taught in mainstream and alternative provision secondary schools in London for 20 years and is also the founder of No More Exclusions, a grassroots coalition movement with a focus on race disparity in school exclusions. Sarah Brownswood is a lecturer in primary education at the University of East Anglia where her research interests include race and diversity in education particularly the context of children's literature and reading and improving teachers' racial literacy. Daniel Kibede is Senior Vice President of the National Education Union and an early years teacher working in the London Borough of Lambeth. And um, so welcome to you all and thank you so much for sharing your time today. I know this is such a busy time for everybody working in education, so we're really grateful that you took the time uh, to come and have this conversation. We thought this was such an important conversation to host at the start of the, the school term, as many teachers are going to be returning to the classroom with a renewed commitment to practicing uh, active anti-racism in their school communities in the events of, uh, in the light of the events of recent months, uh, which have heightened public awareness of the need to fight for equity and justice for black people and other people of colour. So as somebody about to embark on teacher training myself from mid-September, I'm especially uh, looking forward to today's conversation and having the chance to listen uh, to and learn from you all. Each of our speakers today has got a dedicated commitment to and expertise in anti-racist education and so we're delighted to be able to bring them together to share their insights and to ask what it means and what it takes to be an anti-racist educator. To, den, to turn the discourse of anti-racism into sustained everyday practice. Um, so Zara and Ro, I was hoping to kick off with the two of you, if that's okay. And I, I was really interested to know a little bit more about um, how and why you recently came to set up the coalition. And perhaps you could share some of the insights that you've been able to collect over recent weeks from all of the teachers who've posted videos in support of the coalition when they explain about why it is that we need anti-racist education right now. I just feel with schools in predominantly white areas, there have been a few key aspects which affect anti-racist action um, and discourse taking place. As there are so, uh, only, if there are small groups of non-white students, leaderships deem anti-racism work as a lower priority. So there needs to be a part of formal education to prepare um, educators um, and not only that education is um, there to prepare young people for life and employment outside of school so therefore it's really crucial that schools focus on anti-racism work in uh, in schools to avoid the reproduction of racist norms um, I feel that some teachers also lack confidence and expertise to effectively teach pre-colonial history. Um, it can lead to infer inferiorization, embarrassment, disengagement from black pupils. There's also an element of defensiveness when black pupils challenge on African history. Um, many teachers welcome working with experts in this field, but it can be blocked by decisions made by the school boards. So there's also that on top. So anti-racism must be consistent. A colorblind approach to anti-racism is ineffective right now. So we need to have more uh, established black Asian educators, including informal educators, to be brought into schools and paid for what they're doing as well. Um, I feel since the start of lockdown, educators have done everything in their power to support um, have remote learning in place, on-site provision for vulnerable key worker kids, 
um, empathetic, uh, empathetic um, management of the results fiasco that recently happened. And it's profoundly had an impact on global majority, uh, global majority students and working class students. Um, many worked without a break since lockdown. Um, they've been working tirelessly. And throughout this global pandemic, the Department for Education has exhibited an almost total disregard for teachers and educators' expertise, um, their professionalism, their working lives, and especially when it comes to global majority students and working class children. Um, I feel the government's recent chucking of the one billion pound scheme to fund tutoring and small group catch-up sessions with unqualified um, undergraduates is not going to meet anything at the moment. I actually find it quite insulting to do these kind of programs in disadvantages, uh, disadvantaged areas. It seeks to systematically disadvantage the global majority. So we demand concrete, longer term, proper funding and programs to provide effective and fair support. Care and Runnymede and many others have spoken about the concerns regarding urgent support, what is needed to target the most disadvantaged pupils and schools as data has revealed that the gap has widened up to 46% and this within a year. Runnymede wrote to the Education Secretary in April um, including their concerns for uh, black and ethnic minority students. Um, why am I saying ethnic minority? Global majority. I'm going to keep at that. And the racial disparities uh, in an open letter which was released on TES in April. So it just seems that in the global majority, professional organisations representing tens of thousands of educational leaders indicate their concerns. They're met with gaslighting and adversarial op 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 opposition. However, recently the NFER repeated the same concerns and they get one billion pounds chucked up to roll out these programs. Um, so as the term has started and teachers return to the classroom with a renewed commitment to practicing anti-racism in their school communities, we need to see a real commitment. We need to see exclusions eradicated, PRUs, APs. We need to see teachers take responsibility and challenge themselves no more talk of unconscious bias, have those uncomfortable conversations, no more repackaging anti-oppression work to fit an irresponsible narrative of for the comfort of the privileged. These conversations need to be held every day and from here on out. And it's up to you to be the best educator you can be. I live my life by that. I learn every single day. Actively learn and unlearn and be better. We need to see the black curriculum rolled out completely across the country and as a, ling a linguist I, I really need to see evidence of the eradication of terms like EAL which I find are absolutely nonsense. Data shows that EAL students are automatically placed in lower sets. Why is this? These terms are actively seeking to eradicate home languages, a practice still coined from colonialism. So my final point would be, we need to see more global majority teachers and have programs to retain them and allow opportunities to progress. A 2018 report by the Learning Policy Institute, Carver, states that black and global majority teachers boost the academic performance of black and majority students, including improved reading, maths, test scores, improved graduation grades, Increased in, uh, increases in aspirations to attend college. So simply put, black and global majority teachers help those help close the achievement gap. It's not that uh, not just that. Is the report also finds that black and global majority and white students report having a more positive perception of diverse teaching groups, including feeling cared for and academically challenged. Thanks very much. That was incredibly comprehensive. Thanks so much, Ray. There's something um, I think that's really worth highlighting from what you've just said. 
the importance of those sort of everyday challenging conversations that teachers need to host, but also for them to have that long term support of the political kind of landscape sitting beside them uh, and the funding being for those long term investments in supporting the pupils who, who need the support the most rather than short term support from from unqualified teachers, I think is important. And I know that Daniel's going to come back to some of the, the issues that you've raised here, certainly the NEU's framework picks up on the issues around supporting career progression for um, black teachers. Um, and I know that they've also picked up on some of the, the kind of myths that you highlighted um, for predominantly white schools, thinking this just isn't something that they need to focus on um, and, and thinking a little bit about how to combat those. But before we go to Daniel, I'm, I'm just really keen to, to ask um, you and Zara a little bit more about the specific focus that you have around eradicating exclusions. And, and we know that school exclusions disproportionately uh, affect Black Caribbean pupils. And can you tell us a little bit more about how some of the approaches that we currently have in place around behaviour management and exclusions policies uh, particularly affect black pupils and, and, and pupils of colour? And can you also talk to us maybe a little bit about what we could be doing differently and better? Thanks, Laura. Um, and uh, uh, what an act to follow, Ro. You've, you've laid out the, the, the table very very well I feel like there's a lot I don't need to say probably even Daniel doesn't need to say anymore because you've covered it you cover the ground so when it comes to exclusions um, first of all um, you can't in my view you can't be an anti-racist educator and support school exclusion so I'm just gonna put it out there uh, uh, in an unapologetic unequivocal very clear simple English that hopefully everyone everyone can understand when you know what the unequal outcomes are of school exclusion how they disproportionately affect uh, black children children of mixed heritage uh, children who have special educational needs and disabilities children from gypsy and Roma travelers background uh, children who are in care uh, and you still uh, are wedded to the idea that school exclusion have a place in our education system. I think, I think you really have to have a conversation with yourself about whether you belong in a profession, um, uh, why you're so wedded to a system that most countries don't have. When you look around the world about how, how do countries manage so-called persistent disruptive behavior, which is the number one reason why children are excluded in this country according to, to, to your official records. Um, how do other countries manage? Are we saying only England has naughty kids? Uh, or the uh, English, you know, children that, that live in England are, you know, particularly unmanageable, unteachable. I mean, we know without even leaving the island, uh, just look into Scotland and the success they've had in, in reducing exclusion. I'm sure a lot of people would have heard that in the same period, 2016-17, that, you know, uh, Scotland only recorded four or five exclusions. We still excluded seven and a half thousand. So we've really got to think about, you know, what is the difference between our approach, our culture, our ethos, and also our conceptualization of childhood. Uh, what is our conceptualization of acceptable behavior? Um, and that brings us to your question, I think, around what are the policies in place? Everyone's heard of zero tolerance. Uh, in the United States, these are called no excuses policies. Um, but auxiliary to those policies, you also have uh, character education you have uh you know all these all these frameworks that are supposed to create um what us who work as you know working in, in race and i'll come back to race if, if it's okay towards the end because i think it's a bit weird to talk about anti-racist education without coming up with a working definition of race and racism so i think at some point one of us needs to do that it doesn't have to be me but i think we need to um so the, these kind of policies and how racialized the outcomes are, I mean, it's, you know, they, we, we have to look at that. There's a, there's, there's a big campaign at the moment about not having police in schools. To me, that goes hand in hand with school exclusion and then abolishing school exclusion. Again, that is a deeply racialized uh, in terms of outcomes policy. So again, how can you be an anti-racist educators, but then, um, you know, uh, concede that, that actually educators uh, 
and police officers who serve quite different, uh, in my view, function in society, actually belong in the same space, yeah? Um, and also, even if we take the, the presence of police officers in schools, which, by the way, in the Peru where I taught, we had a daily police officer on site pretty much around the clock all the time. And it was normalized. It was just, it was, we didn't really question it. We, we thought, well, yeah, this is what you do. Uh, but now we're, we're hearing about, you know, the program being rolled out to mainstream schools. And it's not going to be... M- you know, which kind of mainstream street? Is, are police officers going to be brought into private independent sector? It's not going to, they're not going to go there, are they? So we know who's going to, which type of schools they're going to, they're going to be placed into and, and, and the outcome of this proportion. There's always, there's also the issue of trust um, as well. And, you know, when it comes, I don't want to go too much into policing. That's not necessarily my field, but I think if we're going to talk about exclusion, we can't ignore the link between school exclusion um, and criminal, the criminal justice system and how that evolves. And again, if you're an educator, um, how do you reconcile, how do you sit with the fact that if as a head teacher, as a, as a governing body, um, you make the recommendation that this child should be excluded? How do you sit with the fact that you're essentially, you're, you're essentially okay to be complicit with the fact that two out of three of those excluded children will get caught up in the criminal justice system. I mean, these are very serious questions that I don't think we can dodge anymore. And they're questions of race and class and uh, able, ability as well. Um, yeah. So I don't know if I've answered enough of what you wanted me to say. Um, also, another quick thing to say on school exclusion, if I could just end on that, is that there's no doubt that school exclusion has been impacted massively by austerity. You know, numbers have gone up over the last 10 years. We know that, obviously. Um, And one of the arguments we often get, and just today we sent off a letter requesting a moratorium to Gavin Williamson, asking him to give a reprieve to children, to put a ban on school exclusion, at least during COVID. uh, Families and children have got enough to deal with with all these new rules and regulations and restrictions and masks and bubbles without also the threat of being excluded, right? Because of all the additional. And straight away, some educators on Facebook response, which I mean, we have seen a thousand times, people like me and Daniel and Ro, that we're having these conversations all the time. Oh, we completely disagree with that uh, request. You know, schools should have, should have the option. Uh, so the, there, is, there is a complete kind of lack of imagination, lack of empathy, lack of compassion for particular groups that were quite happy to package as an underclass, put on the scrap heap of society uh, and pass on the buck. Somebody else could deal with it. So these are, these are really the serious conversation we need to have, particularly now with back to school, with COVID, with all the inequalities uh, ramping up, right? Um, we, we can't, it's a really, to be honest, it's a busy week, but it's a really good week, Laura, to have this conversation. I'm really ha- glad we're having it. Yeah. yeah. It, and, and, it just... and care, sorry, and care was born out of anger because a lot of the stuff that was going on during the George Floyd period, May, mm-hmm. May June, was very deeply felt by a cross section of people. It was really inspiring to me, but there were, there were also all kinds of institutional statements being issued, all kinds of people be taking pictures, kneeling. And it was, so there was part of us that felt really inspired and part of us that thought, my God, this could be a really just performative empty moment. So we wanted to capture that energy we recorded those three six minute videos and we, we, we put out a call for other educators to join our call and to commit to lifelong anti-racist education. Yeah, that's it. That's a really powerful note to end on. And I think the, there is a real danger that the, some of the kind of commitments that we're seeing during this period are just performative and it has to be about so much more than that. This has to turn to direct action. So it's great to see the campaign leading the charge on that. And I totally agree with you that um, we're seeing a perfect storm right now for rising school exclusions. The young people that we know are already disadvantaged in the education system have been even further disadvantaged through that period, and that includes black pupils and um, pupils of colour. I think um, the question that you raised about definitions of race and racism is a is really important one, and I think I'm, I'm going to ask Daniel if there's anything he'd like to say on that, because I know at the beginning of the framework that the NEU set out, you've spent 
some time looking at definitions in in this space I, I don't know if that's something you feel able to kind of come in on I mean I prefer to give my position than the union's position on sure what racism is, if that's all right uh, yeah, of course. In, a, in, a, in, a, in a personal capacity to understand racism you know you have to understand its roots don't you and so racism for me is a global system of oppression that was born out of slavery you know in the 18th 7th century 17th century uh, we had slavery and that was very much about the onset of British capitalism you know uh, people were stolen from Af Africa taken to the Americas to, to, to get the industrial revolution and capitalism in the West pumping uh, and racism was used uh, to reconcile the public mind. It's okay, we were enslaving millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people are dying in the crossing uh, over the Atlantic because they are inferior and we saw the pseudo academics in the universities come up with, you know, pseudo science really um, uh, about black people uh, uh, that, that was used to justify and reconcile the public mind and since then we have got racism as a global system of oppression and that is what it is for me it is used by the powerful uh, to divide black and white uh, to fundamentally keep everybody down uh, but obviously you know uh, it, it is the black pe it's black people uh, around the world who will be who, who bear the brunt of that and, and so that means that racism infects every institution it infects uh, everything uh, because it is something used by the powerful so it is endemic in education it's endemic in the judiciary it's endemic in health we need to recognize and have this public conversation uh, that we need to, 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 to fight racism on a, on a well, on a, on a, on a very serious scale. Uh, if we want to fight racism, we need to recognize that it's embedded in the structures of society, in, 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 in the structures of the economic system. Uh, so for me, actually being an anti-racist isn't just about, uh, you know, trying to challenge things that are happening you know interpersonally but we have to also take on the structure of society and and and, and, and organize for something new is that all right as an answer laura that's incredibly helpful um i I, th I think the the point that you make about how this is embedded in the structures of society is so important for any conversation that we have about what's happening in schools and um, that, that they they equally represent those structures that we see in wider society and perpetuate um, the, the, the issues that we already have around uh, power. I, I think there's something that's really interesting in the work that you've done on the framework about looking at those myths that get perpetuated because of the structural racism that exists in this society. That notion that if we don't have so many uh, black pupils, then racism isn't going to be an issue for us. Or the idea that white working class pupils face uh, more challenges than other people, so they should be uh, our area of focus. Can can you talk to us a little bit about um, the the myths that you ex you've explored, and also how it might be that educators are able to to combat those myths if they're prevalent in the school that they're working in? Yeah, absolutely. So I I, I I taught in two areas of the country. I've taught in the northeast of England, white working class, poor areas where I'm actually teaching now. Uh, I've, I've left London and of course um, I've taught in London, multicultural Lambeth. Uh, and I have never experienced racism teaching in Lambeth uh, from the young people or in my school that's overt. Uh, however, you know, teaching in uh, alternative provision in the northeast white working class area, um, uh, I certainly experienced a fair bit of racism as a, t as a teacher uh, from pupils uh, in particularly. And um, so it is an absolute myth that, you know, white working class areas don't need to be learning about anti-racism to be, you know, in fact, I believe it to be more important when you are not living next to somebody who is a, of a different colour, different culture, uh, you experience, you learn from each other, you recognise um, that, 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 that they, you have a lot in common. Unfortunately, you know, getting back to the argument about austerity, you know, um, in, in, in some of these areas, uh, they've been in the northern on the northeast where you know white monocultural working class areas uh, these have been areas that have been absolutely decimated by austerity uh, ravaged by cuts uh, going back to the 1980s coal mine shut shipyard shut industry shut down the idea of a secure job gone social housing gone and so it's very easy for racism to fester in some of these communities because there is obviously something that's been drip 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 the problem isn't 
the economic system, the problem isn't those in power. The problem is, are oh, there some refugees coming? They're going to take your house. And, it, you know, it's this fear of the other that can that can exist. And all. So, you know, the need for somebody to blame. And unfortunately, you know, there's not a great deal of space in education at the minute uh, because of things like accountability and uh, 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 a regime around Ofsted and league tables that, you know, to have those deep discussions about uh, and create critical learners in these areas has been shrunk. Um, but so, you know, vitally, they're, they're the areas that I feel, um, you know, need anti-racism education more to be honest what was the other example where you mentioned laura the other example that I'd, I'd seen in the framework that really stood out to me was the idea that we need to focus on white working class pupils because they're facing the, the most disadvantage and that there's, it's almost that there's a choice to be made between mm. focusing on them and focusing on issues of race I mean, this is a completely false narrative, and I'm sure, like Zara, uh, I'm sure will have some things to add. Actually, fundamentally, I think the issue is class. All education uh, is, is, is stacked against all working class students. And in fact, we saw that with the exams fast fiasco recently, you know, with the, the, the government algorithm. And within that, there are race disparities. So it, it, the education system oppresses everybody, whether you're black working class or whether you're white working class, it is a, there's a, there's a, there's an issue if you are working class however within that there are race disparities so you are more likely to be excluded if you are black there is a black attainment gap uh, uh, you know uh, you are more likely to live in uh, poverty if you are black and that also has an impact on your educational attainment so you know fundamentally the issue is class all children of a working class background the education is stacked against however there are race disparities that cannot be denied because they are backed up by statistical evidence so if anybody is talking about uh, oh we don't need this here uh, you know it's just the white working class children that need help now in fact you know that needs to be rejected all working class children need the support and we need to recognise the race disparities that exist within education and, uh, 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 and, and organise for change. Hey, hey. Um, I, I, I'm aware that we haven't really given you an opportunity to speak about the work that the NEU is doing and how you're trying to kind of push for a, a change on this front. Would you like to tell us a little bit about the sort of impetus for the framework and then um, how, how it's to be used? So um, the framework emerged uh, it, it emerged out of the Black Educators Caucus uh, maybe three years ago now, and it's been a long time in the making. Um, and what really was the driver, I, I, because it was it, it formed a part of um, an election pledge that I stood on that we would organise for an anti-racism framework for schools and actually the roots of that were about trying to change a culture in education trying to change a culture at school level and the reasons for that is you know it's not just black educate it's not just black young people who have um, a, a difficult experience can have a difficult experience within education but also black staff so if you're a black member of staff you are more likely to end up on capability if you're a black member of staff you are more likely to be made redundant if you're more a black member of staff you're more likely to be disciplined less likely Likely to be go through the the pay grade, and that's and that is because of a, a um, uh, an endemic problem within schools and education more generally um, that needs challenging, and it's very difficult to. Uh, try and win tribunals based on race discrimination a very difficult uh, difficult thing to prove in, in in court and it's also that's just reacting reacting to to to, to the cases uh, as we should when they when they emerge and when we can win them but we also need to try and shift a culture in education don't we try need to try and shift a culture within schools so this was about um trying to create a doc document that members all members it's not just for black members by the way if you're a white member you or a white educator you've got just a the responsibility to try and fight racism in your school as, as, as anybody else it was just about trying to uh, build that change from the bottom so it's not just about looking at curriculum vitally important uh, leadership and uh, voice trying to make sure there is more representation in the higher higher areas of schools um, but also just yeah generally trying to make sure that we are generally trying to create an anti-racist culture in schools and if we create the anti-racist culture in schools then we would hope that as a result we would see less uh, you know less disparity when it comes to those things affecting black educators, less disparity when it comes to those things affecting black children, and a fundamentally a, le a, a, a more fulfilling experience in education for all children, because it's fundamentally alienating, I think, for black children and white children, the education system as it is at the minute, 
Um, so yeah, that's that's its roots. I, I think um, it's a really important focus for the education system to have to bring in more black teachers and uh, other staff and support their progression. Um, certainly the research that we've done on school exclusions, young people reported to us, um, young people who had experienced exclusion who were from uh, black Caribbean and mixed backgrounds were saying that they just don't see teachers like them in school and therefore they don't see people who understand the kind of basis of um, some of the behaviours that they then get pulled up for, disciplined for, uh, and that lack of cultural understanding uh, presenting as a real barrier for them for feeling like they belong in a school environment. That's something that we, we absolutely need to see combated. Um, I guess the reality that we're living with right now is that the majority of teaching staff in schools are white um, and so I'm really interested to bring Sarah in because I know that you've been doing research on um, I guess the, the attitudes um, of, of trainee white teachers um, as they're entering the profession and their preparedness to teach uh, black um, and and other um, peoples of colour. Can can you talk to us a little bit about what you've been finding from that research and what that might indicate about what we need to do now? Yeah, of course. Um, so I work at UEA, University of East Anglia, which is in Norwich, in Norfolk. Um, so Norfolk is a predominantly white um, county. The um, the trainees, so I teach on the primary PGCE, so the primary trainee teachers that we get onto the course um, are predominantly white. Um, we usually have perhaps one or two every year who aren't white, but the rest of them from usually around between 130 and 140 students are, are white. Um, so when I first started, I've been at UEA for about four years, when I first started um, working there, I noticed that whenever the subject of race or racism was brought up, um, you know, in a, in a teaching session or in the context of, of schools or anything like that, um, the trainee teachers avoided getting involved in the conversation. They went from, you know, being really engaged with whatever we were talking about to kind of withdrawing and not wanting to, to talk about it. Um, well, I kind of noticed this and found that really interesting. And then at the end of each year, we do an exit survey with our trainees where we ask them various questions and we ask them to rate their training in different areas as, as satisfactory, good, very good, etc. Um, and the one of the questions that they're asked in their exit survey is, how good was your training in preparing you to teach pupils from minority ethnic backgrounds? And uh, the year that I, the first year that I was there, um, this was rated good or very good by only 60% of, of our trainees. So it was the lowest rated area on, of, of the course. Um, so then that got me thinking about, well, is this an issue with us? Are we not doing enough on our course to prepare students for this? Or is it an issue with the, with the students? Or is it a combination of, of both of those things? Is it a school thing? Because actually they're going out into predominantly white schools. So, you know, that was an issue as well. Um, so I developed some, um, some research. So I did, we did a, an anonymous questionnaire with um, the following year's cohort of trainees. And I also did some focus group interviews where I got students together and we discussed issues of racism and I asked them about their kind of perceptions and we talked about children and, and things like that. And um, the, in terms of the, the research that I did, I think for me, the most interesting question that I asked them or the question that, that got the most interesting response for me was I asked them, to what extent do you think understanding your own ethnicity is relevant to teaching children from um, minority ethnic backgrounds? And the majority of the participants in my um, research said that it was not relevant. So they're all white participants and they all said, no, my ethnicity is not relevant. Um, and they were also, it wasn't just a, a kind of yes, no um, thing, uh, questionnaire, they were allowed to write responses as well. And they were writing things like, I don't have an ethnicity. Um, they were saying things like, well, I have an ethnicity, but I'm white and being white is normal. So they talked a lot about, uh, about um, just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't relevant. It was normal. Um, it, it perhaps would be relevant if they had a different ethnicity, but actually it wasn't. So, you know, what that said to me was that actually not having an awareness of the fact that they do have an, eth an ethnicity probably meant that they weren't aware of white privilege and the advantages that they would have in the education system um, as white teachers, but also that the advantage that the white children that they're teaching will have over children from, from other minority ethnic backgrounds. 
Um, so if they can't understand their own advantages, how are they going to go into school and understand children's disadvantages? Um, and those, those um, participants in the study who did understand and did talk a little bit about white privilege and have that understanding still talked in quite negative ways about black children, Asian children and other children from minority ethnic backgrounds. Um, and some of them also displayed um, evidence of colorblind racism. So they talked about, oh, we, we just try and treat all children equally. I don't notice race. Um, and obviously it's, that's not helpful at all. Um, trainee teachers, all teachers need to be able to notice race. If you try and ignore race, then you're going to ignore racism. So actually it needs to be something which is noticed, which is tackled um, and which we're comfortable talking about. So they also talked a lot about how they didn't feel comfortable talking about it. They didn't know what language to use. So there was a real lack of confidence in, can I even use the word black? Am I being racist if I, if I say black? Um, so yeah, there was a lot of things that kind of came out of that. But um, at the end of doing this piece of research, I didn't want it to just be a piece of research that gets published and, and that's it. So we then used what we found to make changes on the course over the last few years. So we've been adding into our course a lot more um, sessions on, on dealing with these things. So now we have a, a whole session on identity reflection where our trainee teachers are expected to, uh, we give them a pre-reading on white privilege that they read and then they come to the session and we discuss it and we do a lot of identity reflection and then we look at how that is related to being a teacher. Um, we also have lots of meaningful discussion on race. So we look at what is race, what is racism, um and you know things and also what isn't racism because quite often things which people think are racist actually aren't so we look at all of those things as well um, and we make sure that it's embedded throughout everything that we do on the primary pgca so it isn't just a bolt on we're doing a session on diversity now it's also part of what we do throughout english throughout art throughout whatever all of the other primary subjects um that we're doing so so yeah, it's, it's, it's getting better, I think. We're getting better at doing it. And I think our trainees are becoming more confident in talking about those things. Um, but, you know, it's still, I think it's still something that we, we all need to continue to develop so that we're more confident in talking about it so that then our trainees are more confident in talking about it. I think the point that you make about the importance of reflective practice, that this is a process that we've got to keep working on comes back to some of the things that Ray was saying right at the beginning um, and and that does seem to be a, a key kind of thing if you're going to become an anti-racist educator you've you've got to keep working on this this yeah. isn't going to be something that you could go on one course about and no. um, you become better this is an everyday commitment yeah definitely um, and also you know going back to um, some of the stuff that Daniel was saying as well about people you know from predominantly white areas feeling like they don't need to do this work because there's no issue because there's no there's no black people here so I don't need to worry about racism but actually there's more racism um, in those predominantly white areas than there is anywhere else I think and actually they need to do the work it's harder to do that work in many ways because they don't they're not um, you know our teachers are not going out into schools where they're experiencing good positive black, Asian, minority ethnic role models, um, because there aren't very many. They're going into schools where all, of, all the pupils are white, all the teachers are white. And so then they're, they're not, lots of our trainees don't have any genuine relationships with anyone other than other white people. And that makes it much more difficult for them to, um, I think, to just even, for it to be even on their minds and, and kind of on their radar. I think it's really important that you brought up the point about white privilege and trainee teachers not acknowledging that, that they have that, that they have a different sort of, of power that they're taking into the classroom. I, I'm interested to, to know any of your reflections really on what it is that white teachers should be doing. When should they use the power that they have and when should they cede it in order to be truly anti-racist educators? Do you have any reflections from, from your experience? I think that it's um, one thing that I found is that it's really important to um, to kind of think about when it's the right time to speak and when perhaps it, it's it's not the right time to speak. So um, I think that one of the things that I found is that I can use the fact that I you know I work in a university um, to enable myself to to kind of you know widen my audience and talk to lots of people. Um, but sometimes that's about me sitting back and saying, actually, I'm not right. I'm not the right person to do this. 
I'm going to ask, you know, you really should be talking to a black person or a, a, a person of another, you know, not a white person about this. And there are other times where I think that actually it enables me being white gives me a, perhaps a foot in the door that other people haven't got. So, it can, you know, it can be um, a positive or a negative thing, but it's about knowing when is the right time to speak up and when isn't the right time. And sometimes that can be really difficult for people who are just kind of learning this. Um, because what you don't want to do, especially in schools, you don't want teachers to be talking for pupils. Actually, their voices, the, the um, pupils of colour, their voices are really important, not necessarily the white people's, the, the white teachers' voices, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Daniel, you look like you were on the brink of saying something. Do, you, you seem to have quite a response to that question. Sorry. I mean, I could see Zara, I think, smiling a little bit with the white privilege thing, because she knows it's like not, it's probably a term that I find a little bit uncomfortable, really. Okay. Um, in the sense that I don't think the system of racism really benefits white people generally. That doesn't mean to say on an individual level, some white people won't have an advantage over black people, because that obviously is a truth. But I sort of find it problematic because I don't think white people benefit from the system of racism. I think it keeps every, every body, um, everybody down fundamentally. But, and also, it's not a privilege not to experience racism, right? That is my starting point of demands, to not experience racism. I don't view it as a privilege not experience racism. That is how it should be for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do find it um, uh, problematic. But uh, there were some really interesting points in terms of like uh, the teacher training. I, I think this needs to become a key issue for the trade union, actually, because you know, since 1987, I would say there's been a real attack on teacher autonomy, teacher professionalism. Uh, you know, we saw the introduction of the national curriculum, and that was very much about removing our ideas from the classroom. You know, there was a, that famous D DFE. Uh, 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 there's a person who worked for a DF the DFE. It's referenced in some some books, and he said, you know, we we can't have an overeducated, idle class. We'll end up with toxic riots and so on. You know, the the national curriculum was very much about removing uh, hom hom homogenizing education but removing um, uh, progressive ideas and, and, and since then we've seen teacher training become uh, consistently under attack you know we see this idea that you can have troops to teachers and teaching is something you can learn on the job it's an apprenticeship they've tried to purposely remove it from the universities and that means a space for the discussion about race and racism is just really been been drastically removed and obviously the the, the motive for that is if they remove uh, if they attack our professionalism they can attack our terms and conditions they can pay us less and so on um so there does there does need to be a a, a real campaign around that um but i do certainly agree with elevating the pupil voice black pupils voices in the school and in terms of what it means to be an educator an anti-racist educator i don't think it's just about speaking out and challenging although that is important and i don't even think it's just about decolonizing the curriculum and, and making sure that black uh, literature is celebrated and so on and then black history is celebrated all year round this is vitally important, but we've got to really fundamentally change how we teach. Because if I'm teaching about the Haitian revolution, something that all children should know about, I think, how slaves emancipated themselves in Haiti and, and kicked the French out and, and how the British then tried to reinstall it and got beaten and again, and then we had, ended up with the first black republic. I think we should educate about this. If I'm educating this as a teacher who is like, stood at the front of the classroom, the children in rows, I am going to transmit this knowledge. It's going to go one ear and out the other and what we need to be doing is creating critical uh, learners and that is very much by a, a, about a dialogic approach in in, um, in 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 the classroom you know Paulo Freire talks about educating education could either press or it can liberate and education to liberate is, is very much about is, a, is about dialogue um, so I think about being an anti-racist educator fundamentally it's all those are important things but we also have to look at how we teach that is um, a vitally important uh, discussion that needs to be had throughout education and there needs to be a movement built and uh, about reclaiming pedagogy from 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 these monsters really who just want us to to have the children you know in rows oppressed being told what's what and uh, rather than creating and learning for themselves I think that's really interesting there has been a, a real focus on um, what the curriculum should look like, but not so much of a focus perhaps in this kind of discourse about anti-racist education on, on how we're teaching and those pedagogical approaches that are being taken. 
Zara and Mo, I'm aware that a lot of the um, educators who've been responding to your campaign and sending in their videos have picked up on that issue of curriculum though. And what can we learn from, from what they're telling you about how we need to reform the content of what's taught in schools? Can I be really honest? Yeah. I just feel like there is such a massive push on decolonizing the curriculum and everything. And it's really, really wonderful to see all these videos and all these statements and everything, but it just seems like it's skimming the surface. It's skimming off all the fat on the water and it's just leaving all of that dirt and soot underneath and it's not addressing that. And it needs to start from the ground up. Like Sarah made some really, really, poignant points there as well um i'm coming from, i'm from bristol um sees itself as the most wokest city in the uk um we had you know colston um torn down like a, a brilliant day but i am one of 26 black teachers out of 1400 um and then if you look at the unemployment rate and talk about white privilege and all of those things like the employ unemployment rate for black and uh, global ma uh, majority has actually risen up to um, 6.1%, I believe. So uh, for white um, ethnicity, it's at 3.5. So, you know, there, there are all these systematic things that need to be addressed and it's just, it's just scratching the surface. So we need to see more. We need to see giving up power. We need to see people, um, you know, give their time their focus everything it's not work it's it is life and people need to put 100 200 percent into what they are doing for kids and we need to hear the voices of these students we need to hear you know the lived experiences it's just kind of like you know shoved aside um i'm just i don't know i i'm, I'm just out to call out people at the moment like are you really for the cause or are you just making a nice little statement here and if people are really for the cause what advice do any of you have about what the first steps are that they should take you know we're just starting a new school term what's the starting point if you're really committed to becoming anti-racist educators Zara should I come to you yeah can I also be honest <laughs> And this is what this is about. Yes, please. There's a whole tranche of educators that need to retire at this point who are unable and unwilling to embrace change. The change is coming and they can either get with it or get out of the way. So that's that takes, I would say, let's let for argument's sake, that's about a third. Then you've got those in the middle that are kind of like, oh, what's going on? Is the revolution coming? Are we going to have to learn new ways? Yes, we're going to have to learn new ways because the old ways ain't working. And, and the young people are leading the way. Look at what the student movement, look at what Marcus Rashford were able to achieve, right? With all of that, with social justice at the very heart. So those educators are sitting on the fence. This is a good time to get off the fence and decide which side. Otherwise, mm -hmm. early retirement is an option for you also. And then you've got the ones that are kind of like in it, wanting to, to or, or about to go in it, like you, Laura, in it, wanting to do the right thing, wanting to do things according to social justice. And I would say, hopefully, intersectional justice, if we look at all those different layers of disadvantage and inequality, and how they compound and cumulatively produce in uneven outcomes, those are really those are the those are the, the educators that are, that are ready but it's an it's an it's a lifelong journey i think sarah said it you know it's it's an ongoing process none of us can say i have the anti-racist certificate like you're not gonna get it uh black people can't get it brown people can't get it white people can't get it uh, it's not available it's not available in any stores uh what we must then do is flatten difference we have to recognize difference we can't say we don't talk about race in here. We are all the same. I don't see color. I think those conversations are redundant. Now let's, let's part them. That, that, that era in education is over. And like I said, if you're not, if you're not willing to let go of those discourses, it's time to maybe have a think about, do I belong in education? Because young people and those young teachers you were talking about, Sarah, are ready to have this conversation. They need these tools. To me, the teacher training 
is, is, is the knife and fork, right? If I'm going to use a Eurocentric, by the way, you don't need knife and fork to eat a meal because in my uh, Somali family, we eat with our hands and that's absolutely fine as well, by the way. Um, but let's say, you know, we're in London, most people would use, unless they're eating, I don't know, chips or whatever, knife and fork. Well, teacher training is your knife and fork. So you need your fork and your knife to be fairly sharp. Sometimes you're going to need a spoon as well, right? If you're eating soup or yogurt or whatever, pudding. But if there's nothing on your plate, which is the curriculum of what's on the plate, it's not being seasoned, it's not being cooked, it's nutritionally, you know, insufficient, uh, deficient, then the children, the young people, the educators and so on, um, aren't going to get what they're entitled to. And a, a final note on the white privilege, and I know that's going to make Daniel smile because we have these debates a lot. To me, white privilege is a starting point of anti-racist education is where you look in the mirror and go, what am I? What advantages and disadvantages am I walking around, if I'm, if I'm quoting uh, um, Peggy McIntosh, you know, in my knapsack of privilege? That's just a starting point, right? Um, let's talk about institutionally what's going on. And let's also talk about systemically what's going on. So there are kind of like three levels of work that has to be done within anti-racism. And I hope that this flagellation, you know, I'm gonna go mea culpa, mea culpa, you know, whip myself because I'm a white person. I've got, we, we need to move past that. That's from the eighties, same as unconscious bias. The bias right now is very conscious. Anyone who's unconscious at this point is comatose. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you very much. That's fair. Um, Sarah, um, I just want to get your final reflections on what, what is it that, that we should be looking to do now? I mean, I just to, to say, first of all, I agree with everything that everybody's um, just said there. And I just, I think that, um, you know, we want teachers to go into schools and be anti-racist educators. But most of them have had no training in doing that whatsoever. And that's why I think teacher training is absolutely key. And, that, and the conversation about teacher training isn't happening beyond some people who, who do the work like I do in teacher training who are having the conversations themselves. But, you know, nobody's telling me to do this. It's something that I thought actually this needs doing. And so, so at my university, we're doing it. But from a, a kind of higher up level, there's no conversation about teacher training happening. So I don't know how we can expect teachers to be confident anti-racist educators if they're not getting training in it at the point where they're actually learning to, to do all the other things that are really important in teaching. To me, that says... This isn't as important as all the other stuff that you're learning when you're a teacher. And it isn't as important. It's probably more important than the other stuff that, you know, a lot of the other stuff that's taught in teacher training. So, you know, there's a part of me that thinks, should this be part of the teacher standards? Should this be part of the Ofsted framework? You know, I, I hate to think of, of us only doing things as teachers because they're in the teacher standards or they're in the Ofsted framework. But... Sometimes that does send a message that this is important and this is serious now and we're actually going to check and see if you're doing this or if you're not doing it. So I think that those changes at you know, a higher governmental level really need to happen. And I think that you know, on a kind of personal level for you, starting out on your kind of teacher training journey, um, I would say that one of the most important things that you can do is go and read stuff. There are so many amazing books that have been written on this topic in the last few years. And if you haven't read them already, go and go away and read them because, you know, they really do um, help you to, to look at the things and think about the things and have practical um, things in them that you can go away and put into place without spending time asking people about what to do. And I think that that's something that happens a lot is, you know, um, there's lots of people asking black people at the moment what they should do. Well, actually, just go and read the books, go and look online, and you can find out what to do. You don't need to um, be bothering lots of people who are already doing their own work and who, you know, are kind of dealing with the emotional um, effects of, of the summer of, of, that we've had. Yeah, we all need to do the work for sure. I'm really aware of time and we ought to wrap up, but I, I'm just wondering, um, Daniel Rowe, are there any final comments that you want to make if we had another another minute for just final thoughts? 
I mean, yeah, I, I just, in terms of what it means to, for new teachers to be an anti-racist educator, I fundamentally agree with the attacks on, about the attacks on teacher training and how we need to organise uh, for effective teacher training and so on. But I think new teachers need to run, uh, understand and recognise that racism is about power. And we are only going to shift things uh, by shifting the power relations. Whether you're black, whether you're LGBT, a woman, uh, or even if you're white working class living in a, a, an area that has been... Uh, crushed over the past 30 years our liberation is all tied up within within each other and so to fundamentally be an anti-racist education educator i think we need to look at two things first is like what we do professionally and that's the interpersonal sort of conversations that we have as a professional teacher in the staff room and so on uh about challenging and uh, racism embedding the anti-racism charter and, and things like that but also then what we do as a practitioner um about organizing for a decolonized education in our school setting in our school, uh, uh, in our school, you know, in, in in our school, taking control of it ourselves, but also about how we teach children. Because fundamentally, if we don't teach children to be critical beings, they're not going to be anti-racist beings. So pedagogy has to be has to be central to that. But fundamentally, we are only going to ever shift those power relations, aren't we? If we collectivize. So that is why I would advise everybody who is going into education as a teacher or teaching assistant to get involved in their union and to fight things for things collectively because that's the only way uh you know we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll shift things uh, i think it was bob crow who said that uh if we spit on our own we'll do nothing but if we spit together we'll drown the bastards so that's uh that's 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 what we can do that's great um Ro, any final words um yeah um as a new teacher because i've only just completed my uh nqt year Oh, congratulations. Um, thank you so much. Um, it's not just like only a proud moment, but when I started out, I didn't think that I would be here right now, if you know what I mean. So as an educator, you have a duty to give back to your community. So mm -hmm. if you see injustices happen, speak out, do something about it and don't be silent about it. That is the perfect note to end on. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that really is all we have time for, and I'm aware of taking up more of your time than we said we would, so we will have to wrap up. Sarah Rowe, Daniel, Sarah, I just thank you so much for all of the insights and for sharing so generously today. And um, if you're watching along online, um, you can head over to the RSA website now for links to explore our speakers' work further. Uh, do check out their profiles, follow them on Twitter and support the work that they're doing. As Daniel said, join them in this collective action. And we'd love to hear your ideas on how we can create a fairer education system. So do get involved in the conversation across social media using the hashtag RSA education. And I just want to say a final big thanks again to Zara Rowe, Daniel and Sarah. Um, and thank you all for watching. <laughs>